both in the LDS and the FLDS. Priesthood authority and being a good priesthood leader in a home is one of the most important things for a man to do. And it's the most important thing that a woman looks for in a man because I cannot get to heaven in Mormon theology without my husband. And? And without him being worthy exactly. to take us to heaven. So when a therapist comes and tells women, your husbands are not worthy. They are not worthy priesthood holders anymore. That is then shattering yeah. a woman's eternal life, their eternal marriage, their eternal family with their children is now in jeopardy. Hey everyone, welcome back. My name is Sam. And I'm Melissa. I grew up in the FLDS community. It is a polygamous group run by Warren Jeffs, and I moved out when I was 18 years old. I was raised LDS. Sam and I have been married for nine years and have two awesome kids. We do, we do, and we are excited to be back We're here with you today. We're going to be covering the topic of the abuse by Ruby Frankie and Jody Hildebrandt. In particular, we are going to be reacting to an episode of Impact Nightline that was on Hulu. So you can watch that and follow along if you want to see more of what we're re particularly reacting to. We felt like they did a good job on that yeah. newscast of giving a well-rounded picture. Now that we are weeks into this, I remember getting a text like a couple hours after it happened because they were arrested in Ivins, or the kids were found in Ivins, Utah, and I used to live in Ivins. Yeah. It's right outside of St. George. And so I had a family member being like, did you hear about this mom in Utah and what's going on? So we wanted to cover it, particularly because we've had a lot of viewers ask us our thoughts on the religious aspect and some of the practices that Jody Hildebrandt was in as a therapist. A lot of Mormon bishops referred people to Jody Hildebrandt for a lot of years and they are both LDS women and so a lot of people have been asking our opinions on that. There are two victims of Jody Hildebrandt in this episode that give a lot of insight and you can find out more about the abuse and the trial and things in a lot of other podcasts. It, it's everywhere, oh, honestly. Man. Yeah, it is everywhere. And that's why we were excited to see this newscast episode come out to kind of give a overview of kind of everything that's been going on up to this point and give us some insight also to discuss and talk about in the religious aspect because that's really what we want to focus on is why, why someone that would have such a strong belief in a religion that is all about family why would they cause this harm to these kids? Why would they do this? To Such kids awful and to families. Thing. And to, and, yeah, and to adults, yes, and to families. So it's just hard to wrap your brain around when you think, well, if this person is doing this awful, awful thing, it must have nothing to do with the religion because the religion teaches all about good values and family values and that. But it's crazy to see how much it kind of crosses over to the religious aspect when people do these things. And I really expected that this was going to be an episode that I would be ending up taking the lead on of like, okay, well, I grew up LDS Mormon, and so I'm going to have a lot of similarities and understand where she's coming from in some things. There were so many similarities to the FLDS. I was oh, yeah. like, this is the same type of stuff that happens in spiritual manipulation in the FLDS as well. So yeah. there's definitely connections, I feel like, to both. But again, they both have the same fundamental principles. So Yeah, and the, the FLDS, something that kind of stood out to me based on the way I was raised as well is that some of these rules and things that they were required to follow, these really, really strict things that they were forced to do that would make them feel that they were, I don't want to say worthless, but make them feel inferior to other people, especially those over them, was something that... I'm not blaming my parents. I think my parents tried really hard to, to do a really good job, but the church that I grew up in, the religion behind it, kind of made us feel that way. It made us feel like we were so inferior and almost worthless compared to these godlike figures that we were supposed to be worshiping. Yeah, and even in the first interview with Jody's niece, mm -hmm. Jesse, and they talked about the fact that they were made to feel worthless and yeah. to feel like they were liars and just yeah. these awful people from hell basically and they had said you know 
at 15, 16 years old, they started to rebel against the LDS Mormon church. And even at that moment when they said the word rebel, Sam and I looked at each other and I said, rebelling is so... What does that mean? <laughs> it's so dependent <laughs> yeah. on the community that you grow up in. So just so some of our viewers know, some of the things that you can re be rebellious for at 15, 16 years old, as like how I grew up being raised Mormon, some of the things that they might have been rebellious could be, the only thing they mentioned was sneaking out, mm. right? Wanting to wear a tank top where I grew up, super rebellious. If you wanted to wear short shorts, super rebellious. If you wanted to wear a bikini, if you wanted to get more than one piercing in each ear, that would be considered rebellious. I know people that were rebellious enough to get a belly button piercing in high school and hide it from their parents wow. all the way into adulthood. I kid you not. They hid it. They hid it all the way wow. into adulthood and after getting married and no, their parents never found out. So these are the type of things, kissing a boy mm. or going on a date before turning 16 could yeah. also be considered rebellious. So those are just some of the simple things. Whereas Jesse was also talking about the fact that they were discovering that there was queerness in their life and they didn't know how to explore that because within the Mormon religion, you can't be queer. I should rephrase that. You cannot act on any of your queer Ur intuitions. Urges. Or urges, yeah. yes. So in those situations, it would be extremely hard to navigate being a teenager if you're having these doubts and these thoughts and if there's any type of small rebellion, it could be looked at as much bigger than what the rest of the world. In the rest of the world, wearing short shorts and tank top and having two piercings is not even a thought for a 16 year old girl. Right. But within Mormonism, that could all be considered major rebellion. Well, and you have to remember too that there's the church rules and guidelines, and then there's the family's the guidelines on top of that. So mm -hmm. who knows? I mean, I look back in my life and if I was caught running in the house, that was a big punishment and a really bad thing because there was a rule that we were not allowed to run in the house. So when she was being rebellious, you also have to ask yourself, what were there rules were there? Were there rules in the family that were so strict that maybe it was something as simple as listening to a certain kind of music, maybe? Yeah, that's so true. It's hard to know what exactly that meant for uh, Jesse in that situation. Yeah, and unfortunately they were left by their parents at a family gathering and yeah. they were left into the care of their Aunt Jody. and they even said they thought their parents were doing it because oh Aunt Jody is a therapist and so they can fix you know our child by this and Sam and I, I had to pause on this as well because it sounds so crazy to send away your child to somebody else to have them like fixed, but in Utah, it's really not. Yes. And I had Sam Google it and he'll have to read it. How many, I don't want to call them youth groups. There's youth homes. I don't know the proper term for them, but these places that you send kids, the troubled youth, troubled youth homes or troubled youth camps, some take them out into the Utah wilderness. I've had friends that worked at those actually, that in college they would take kids out and they'd be gone for two or three weeks. They take the troubled youth out, they do whatever wildernessy stuff and then bring them back and supposed to help these kids grow. But I was like, I wonder how many, and it, is that just in Utah or does that happen in other places? Yeah. And? The, wilder the wildernessy stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely helpful. Okay, so, and I did find this here. This says, since 2015, some 20,000 kids have been sent to programs in Utah that cater to parents and state agents, agencies desperate to find help for certain teenagers. And it goes on to talk about how Utah has way more uh, of these youth facilities. youth facilities than any other state in the United States. Kids who are rebellious get sent away to go and be reformed. And I know this because we have dear friends that owned one of these places. And I grew up with, we call them being foster parents, but you weren't really a foster parent in the sense that the state had given you the child. My parents took troubled teens from this youth home that parents would pay for their kids to go to, to straighten out their kids. And then we would get teenagers every once in a while when I was little. Yeah. For certain periods of time but now as an adult i wonder 
the kind of impact you have sending your child away saying you're so hopeless that I can't do anything for you and someone else has to fix you. What kind of impact is that making on the person's life, on the kid's life right. more than even just the natural? And I know there's all sorts of situations that, uh, you know, we have to be sensitive because there are certain kids that, you know, maybe they're doing certain things that they actually need professional help. Yes, absolutely. And these parents, while I don't agree with it, mostly I don't agree with how they did it. They didn't give Jesse any indication that it was going to happen. Woke up, no longer, no longer with parents. Your parents left you. Now you're with your aunt. Yeah. And they even said that they were open to it at first. Like, oh, maybe this will help. Yeah. You know, my aunt is a therapist, so maybe. And then abuse started happening. It is so sad to see Jesse's family and parents leave them with their aunt to begin with. It's also something that's not out of the realm of possibility, especially I feel like within the LDS community, like we had those all around us. We knew that if you were a rebellious teenager, you could get sent to one of those. Yeah. I wouldn't say I like feared it. I was a pretty good teenager though, but <laughs> that it was definitely something that was understood that it could happen and that your parents could send you to those. Hmm. So I don't know, just something to think Interesting. about. Interesting. You know, of, of all the strictness that I grew up in, being sent away to a camp actually never was something that I feared or thought that might happen to me. That they would send you away? Yeah. That they, I mean... <laughs> well, <laughs> kind of Being sent away. to a camp anyway. Being sent away on your own and just you're drop you off and say, oh, good luck, hope you figure this out. If you sinned against the church strongly enough, that was definitely a possibility. But, I feel like that'd be worse. But I, I was just referring to being like a camp, like a youth camp or something. Mm -hmm. That just wasn't something that was an option for some reason. Well, and some of them, like the one that our family friends ran, it was a big house. Hmm. And these people were basically just living in, they, the kids were just sent and they lived in a different house with more strict rules mm -hmm. and yeah, it, it was interesting. Like now looking back, I'm like, it's very interesting. I should have my parents on because I know that, again, they were involved. They were yeah, these foster experience. parents for these kids. So we might well, have them on talking about I it. I just realized I, I say I wasn't afraid of being sent to one of these camps. But then you mentioned the rules and everything. And I should everyone's probably laughing at me because I was sort of raised in a camp. <laughs> <laughs> there was no room for there, you yeah, to be it rebellious. Was either, yeah, if I rebelled against the camp, then I was just out. So maybe that's a better way to look at it. Yeah, Jesse talks about a lot of the abuse that Jody did. And they were talking about the fact that there was duct tape used, mm -hmm. that they had to sleep outside in the freezing cold, and in the middle of the winter in, in Utah. Like, that's, that's a big deal, right? Sleeping outside to the point where Jesse was fantasizing self-harm, anything mm -hmm. to get out of the situation. They went to the police. And then ended up right back with Aunt Jody again until they finally ran away. Right. And the, even the other stuff that they were saying about Jody's beliefs that I want to quote this properly, but saying that Jody believed that God was working through her, that Jody was going to single handedly change the church. And a lot of those things, Jody being like a sex and porn therapist for the church, I find it interesting because Jesse even said that they weren't allowed to use tampons because they were told that, that they could masturbate with that. And they even said, Jesse said, that they didn't know that that was even something that could be done with female anatomy. Mm -hmm. And that rings true to LDS upbringing. I did not know that that was possible, that, that, yeah. that female females could masturbate until I was 19 years old. Was right. when I, found, I was in college when I found out that that was even a possibility that people could do that. So yeah. Jesse's saying that, you know, I didn't even know that was a possibility. I had never had sex. I had never done these sexual sins and I'm being treated like I'm this horrible liar that the duct tape is to show that I'm a liar and that every word out of my mouth is a lie and that I shouldn't be talking to people. I can't wear makeup. I have to cut my hair. I have to get rid of all these things that identify me and I would have to write all my sins down and Jody would read them back to Jesse while Jesse was on their knees begging for forgiveness, which that to me is so anti-Christian hmm. to say that Jesse needs to confess sins to Jody yeah. instead of 
well, one, instead of their maker, and then even within Mormonism, you need to confess it to a bishop, not to a therapist. Right. Oh, man. It was man. so sad. Yeah, I feel awful for Jesse and everything that they went through was just, oh, man. And this was happening by and Jody, right? A family member that's supposed to be there loving and helping, not torturing and abusing. It just... It's so hard to comprehend why this was going on. Obviously, Jody has some serious issues, <laughs> right? To be able to do this to children or adults, all of the stuff that she, all the harm that she caused, and the lies. Uh, what was the name of the other person on the show that talked about uh, Jody completely ruined his marriage and his, his life, his relationship with his children? All of that was completely destroyed because of the lies that Jody created for what reason? Yep, Adam Paul Steed yes. got sent to group therapy with his wife from his Mormon bishop, was told, go here, it's amazing. And he was talking about the fact that they would. It would start out fine and then they would separate, Jody would separate into women's group and men's groups and ended up telling the wives all these horrible things that yeah. he was an abuser, that he was a child molester, that he was a pedophile, that he was the most violent, all these things of what they were. And yeah, how could that not destroy a marriage if you, your therapist is coming in and saying, oh, I just had therapy with your husband and he's telling me all these things. Right. I mean, can... Imagine how difficult that she's putting the wife in such a difficult spot because even if he says, hey, no, I, I never said or did these things, not only is Jody claiming that he did, but she is also a spiritual leader in some sense because the church has recommended her to so for so many people that the wife is probably thinking, no, she's not only a licensed therapist, but she is in high standings with the church, so she must be telling me the truth. Yeah, like, absolutely. It's such a, a tough spot to put a relationship to, uh, you know, a husband and wife in. Yeah, and it was the same with the Frankies, because Kevin Frankie was talking about the fact that when him and Ruby were in couples mm. therapy, and that Jody was their marriage counselor, and then his wife goes on a trip with Jody, comes back and wants to be separated, and he didn't understand what was going on, but that in the men's sessions, again with Jody, that he was told he was greedy, that he was this, he was that, and that they all needed to repent. So it seemed like a very common theme that he, that Jody was really trying to belittle yeah. these men, make them feel like nothing, and then tell the women that their men were nothing. and. This kind of comes into the last and probably the biggest point that we had gotten asked the question before about this, about why in a religion that is so family oriented are somebody like Jody Hildebrand separating families or trying to tear these families apart? And how can you do that when the center of the church is family? And again, it reminded me of the FLDS. The FLDS, their whole purpose in life is to have families. As many kids as possible, there's no birth control, as many children as the Lord will give them, and their purpose is to raise these children in righteousness for the next life. Their whole everything is centered around family. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly right. And everyone that is a part of the FLDS Church is in a way having to prove themselves that they are worthy, that they're good enough, and all of these things all the time to be a part of this most important thing on earth, which is the family, right? But then they twist it in a way, or Warren, I guess, specifically, but some of the other leaders have twisted it in a way that if you're not perfect, you're not worthy to be here and be a part of this. And so that's how they have been able to rip apart some of these families by making them feel like they are worthless, that they're immoral, that they're wicked, that they're evil, all of these different things to convince them that they're not worthy to be a part of this family or God's church. And that's how they've been able to split up families. Yep. And I just wanted to emphasize this because yes, families are one, one of the most important aspects of Mormonism, especially within the LDS yeah. and mainstream Mormonism. But family still comes after God. Mm. 
even covenant to make everything, it comes after God. And for the LDS church, God and the church are hand in hand because it's God's church. And I remember as a young kid in general conference, which is there's two big conferences a year in the LDS church where you get to listen to the prophet speak, other church leaders speak. And what they speak is considered scripture. It literally gets printed out, gets sent to you. You're supposed to study it like with your scriptures. And I remember a story of a girl choosing to join the church and leave her family because her family was like not approving of it and they were going to disown her if she joined the church. And the praise that the prophet gave over the pulpit for her choosing the church over her family. And I remember, I must have been like 10 years old, and I remember thinking, I have to choose the church over my family. Okay. That's what was being taught to me. And ultimately, that is what matters. And in cases like this, both in the LDS and the FLDS, priesthood power, priesthood authority, and being a good priesthood leader in a home is one of the most important things for a man to do. And it's the most important thing that a woman looks for in a man. 100%. I can't even tell you how many, I was just reading the other day, I saw something that I had written when I was like eight or nine years old, like I can't remember if it was primary young women's, super young, like before a teenager. And it's like goals and where I wanna be in 20 years. And it's like married to a worthy priesthood holder. That worthy priesthood holder part is so important because I cannot get to heaven in Mormon theology without my husband. And? And without him being worthy exactly. to take us to heaven, and to the highest degree of celestial glory. When I say heaven, I know there's lots of degrees. I'm talking about getting to live with God again when I say heaven. Right. And to become as God. And to become as God. I cannot do that without him and without him being worthy. Yep. So when a therapist comes and tells women, your husbands are not worthy. They are not worthy priesthood holders anymore. That is then shattering yeah. a woman's eternal life, their eternal marriage, their eternal family with their children is now in jeopardy if their husband does not remain faithful. And that's exactly what the FLDS do as well. Why do the women stay when their husbands get sent away? They want to be remarried to, to be. a worthy priesthood holder that will get them to live with God again and their children. Right? And if they find out, and even, I mean, in the FLDS case, half of the time it's not even true. The man didn't even do anything. But if they're told he's not a worthy priesthood holder anymore, their instinct is, well, I need to be with one who is so that I can actually have all of the work that I go through in this life. Everything that I'm doing as a mother, as a wife, everything will be for naught if I don't have a worthy priesthood holder to go to the celestial kingdom with. And I think ultimately that's why these women will leave. And that's why it ends up being more important than family. Yeah. Sorry, that's that true. was a long rant. Well, and it's, it's an interesting concept because it's all about the family in the sense that family is eternal, right? But what happens in this life is just a blip on the radar. All you have to do is just prove yourself, get through this life, and then the glory and the beauty and all the amazingness of what we've been promised is to come in the next life. If you are worthy, if you are sealed spiritually for time and all eternity. And so there's just, it's, I don't know, the way that it's looked at is this life is just this tiny little piece of almost nothing. Of eternity. Very important because you do have to prove yourself but there's just so much more that, that these both LDS and FLDS members look forward to in the next life that will cause them to get a divorce in this life if they think that their husband is not a worthy priesthood holder. It shatters marriages yeah. all the time. So it was so sad to see that. I mean, it shatters marriages. Adam Paul Steed talked about the fact that, you know, Jody was telling the church what was being talked about in therapy. So if someone did confess or talk about working through something in therapy. She was sharing it with the church, which could create church discipline. She was sharing it with BYU, which if anything against their honor code was shared, you know, Adam Paul Steed said that he was kicked out of BYU. He lost his degree. He lost his future career. All of, and I mean, they can kick you out and just not give you your diploma at the end. Like if you're in your senior year, too bad. If you if there's any reason for them to yeah. kick you out because of an honor code violation. So she was breaking that trust as a therapist. She seems like she's pitting against 
these husbands against their wives. She's divorced herself, which I thought was interesting. I did Google because I was like, man, it seems like she has like this vendetta against that these so, men are so evil for you, you know would, greedy this yeah. that and the other and that's what I thought too. But then you're but then you see all of the abuse that Jody caused to the 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 women and the the kids like Jesse for example, and it just makes me realize and think that Jody just wanted to be the most powerful. She wanted everyone to have to answer to her and she was in charge of their lives and she was in control. And that's why Jesse was so happy to say that if Jody was sitting next in the same room with Jesse, that Jesse would say, you have no power. Yeah, it was super powerful. And Adam Paul Steed said that he would say, your lies about us will never hurt us again. And our heart breaks for them anybody who was affected by this now more and more victims are coming out coming out the fact that even ruby frank's own daughter had posted finally finally in quotes when her mom's being arrested is so sad and yeah. the fact that cps had been called on them so many times and that the police put in a warrant now there's actually an investigation against child protective services in utah about the fact that they didn't get the warrant to be able to talk to the children personally and make sure they were okay and to be able to protect these children and the fact that even grown children are saying this happened to me this was happening and they're not being listened to is heartbreaking and we as yeah. like society and a state like as a state just need to do better a hundred percent hundred percent and something else that we have to consider as well is how many other children because you hear about people that are involved in abuse cases all the time and they don't dare. They're afraid to speak up because of whatever it is that they're told will happen to them if they do. And, you know, and so sometimes they, the children hold back from telling. And in this case of the 12, 12 year old boy, he finally got to such a bad place where he thought he was, I mean, he was almost dead. It sounded like when he showed up to the neighbor's house and pleaded for help. So, but how many years did he deal with this before he finally broke down and, and, and fled for some help? Yeah, hopefully there will be justice in this newscast. They did say that each count of felony child abuse can be up to 15 years. And, you know, if they can prove that it happened six different times, then that can be a whole lot of years. And they can count that for each child that it happened to. So yeah. I hope that these children get justice and that they are able to get the help that they need yeah. through proper therapists and be able to uh, have fruitful and happy lives. It would have to be difficult to trust a therapist after that. Yeah. So hopefully they can move past that and realize that not all therapists are Jody's and, you know, just get the help they need, like you say. So yeah. uh, it took us a while to. <laughs> even talk about this topic it's such a difficult one child abuse is just or abuse of any kind it's just so hard to discuss but thank you all so much for being here with us again we really do appreciate your love and support and we do feel that from you all so thank you thank you guys so much and if you want to hear more of what it was like for sam to grow up in polygamy or more insights on things like this and where religious aspects of fundamental mormonism or mainstream mormonism have impacts on current social situations or current social stories, yeah. please um, like and subscribe. And you can also leave in the comments any other stories that you want us to commentate through our lens. Yes. And if you prefer just listen, we do have our podcast available as well. So look us up there as well. And thank you all so much. We'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon.